a target, but at least yeah. he's built the lineup with an awareness that this is going to be a really popular deck going into the tournament, so I better not be unprepared for it. Looks like we're going to be starting off with a Mage Mirror, though. It is indeed. We've seen these look pretty one-sided so far today, as one player seems to either be destroyed by the Rogue or completely outdraw their opponent at certain stages of the game. But here, for um, G9, he's got a respectable start to get things going. But for his opponent, Aaron, has the Mana Worm, the Archaeologist. If he can get some kind of a secret reduction card in something like the Cabal Lackey or the Kirin Tor Mage, this could just be an absolute blowout defeat. Yeah, and I think it's also a huge boon to the player that has the coin <laughs> in this matchup, just because a lot of the ways that the apprentice reductions work make it so that having that one extra man of flex could make you have a really effective swing turn where you use just that little bit more um, mana that could get you ahead in the matchup. That's right, but here for Aaron, he is going to have to have the follow-up to deal with this Archaeologist, because at the moment the stat line is not uh, too good for him against the Mana Worm, but with the follow-up of something like Coin into Spell uh, Secret here, or even the Primordial Glyph to look for something that he can cast right away, he could even go Coin into the Secret he gets from that. It means he's got a very good chance of being able to kill off the Archaeologist if he does go for that. Right, but I'm in favor of going for a coin of an actual existing okay. secret just to make sure you get that value trade what because I do. think it's too good to pass up. Sure. Do. Um, do you like the glyph better? Uh, no, I think I can agree with you because getting your mana worm down to one health isn't even that in this instance, because if your opponent is playing a ping uh, on three mana, they're floating a bit of mana, you can then follow up with the Archonologist or something on your following turn, and you're still putting yourself in a fairly I dominant agree. position to start pushing some of that minion damage. Right, both of these mages are tempo decks, obviously, and so <laughs> being able to maintain something on board and force your opponent to answer, and then put something else on board means you're in the driver's seat, you got tempo. So oh, I really down. think that um, going for the surefire way of getting that value trade is the best way to go for this for Aaron. I like the explosive runes here as the secret of choice. Okay. An incredible yeah, Ooh, all that talk for nothing there. <laughs> so what do you think he's going to be saving the coin for here in this particular matchup? Is there anything he's really looking for in terms of break points and mana? Well... I think being able to go for an early Firelands portal is okay. really, really important. Of course, it's not in hand yet, but that is a card with tempo basically in the subtext. <laughs> <laughs> Remove something, put something on board. So yeah. if he's able to swing onto a corridor creep or something really relevant like that, that could be the thinking behind it. Also, maybe just wanting to save um, the coin so that... The alternative was that if he played a secret, he'd be on three mana the next turn, and you don't really want to play Archonologist on three. That's a very, very good point. And that was perhaps another reason to go for the Glyph, because you can get a two mana spell, yeah. like Flame Geezer, uh, another Primordial Glyph, or Frostbolt, and then it's really good, and you still have the coin for leading into your next turn. Um, and the way this has worked out, it's looking like uh, G9 will have to be having to go for the ping on the Mana Worm on turn four, uh, which is a lot better for him, actually, because you have way more two drops that you can throw down in combination with the hero power then to start taking out what is on board for Aaron. So I don't know if this has worked out perfectly for Aaron or what he had in hand, but with the pickup of Kabul back as well, this is going to into a much higher tempo play. Right, and it's a great minion to be able to get the explosive runes proc on. You don't care about it dying. It's basically dead anyway as a one health <laughs> ping bait. Um, and so uh, I'm still liking the explosive runes here. Um, if he plays a secret, he could actually just trade the mana worm in, although I don't like that trade. As we saw in the previous set, going for several minions that have one health is actually really, really annoying for yep. the other mage. It's very true. And keeping one thing at three health is basically just a valet or frostbolt bait as well. And now for Aaron, finding that arcane intellect, while it's not actually put into his deck, given the power of a Luna drawing you basically your whole deck, it's really good right here to able being making him able to find some of those secret synergy cards in addition to just having the secrets, which at the moment are this isn't a great hand for him, but he has had that fantastic start with Mana Worm, so maybe he can start to come back in terms of his card quality and make up for what's happening in his hand now. Yeah, I actually think that is an insane pickup from the glyph. Um, given a hand that's just full of secrets, Aaron really needed the refill, and he goes for the trade that we talked about a while ago, which makes a lot of sense in this matchup. So now um, G9 is forced to ping the Mana Worm, basically, and oof, are we going for... Yeah, I, I prefer Glyph over a Tempo Valley there. Okay. So. 
And in this instance, having to go for Spellbender, which, you know, it can draw out something like a Frostbolt or a Fireball to protect some of your minions on board. But there's not really anything he cares too much about protecting. Uh, and this is kind of the downside of what can happen with this Pyroblast variant of Temperament, which seems to be pretty unanimous at this point uh, with the Pyroblast and Ice Block, is that if you can't get in that early minion pressure and lock down the early board, we it's just many. not doing anything. At the same time, I think that Spellbender is actually a really good pick with Double oh, okay. Valley in hand, because on turn 5, he can go secret into Double good Valley, point. which is insane. Of course, we see that a counter spell comes down for Aaron, so <laughs> that dream is dead. There's but, always something. Ah, uh, we can see that Genite had it in mind. Yeah. And so now does have the ability to proc the counter spell with one of the two secrets, uh, one of the two spells in hand, sorry. Uh, the Frostbolt being chosen to go for it here because it does still allow you to go for Spellbender and Medivh's Valet. Yeah. Even though you're having your guy blown up by the runes, you don't care too much because you just need to start mitigating this damage. Because without even an Ice Block available for G9, you will not be able to start fighting back against the minion pressure if it falls too far behind. I really think this reminds me of that one dungeon run boss, right? This, the trapped room. It's like one player plays something, oh, blows uh, up. Yeah. You play your spell, nope, no, you can't. And we move on. But eventually one player gets ahead, and that's looking like it's Aaron. Nice and clear here. That seems to be what will happen when I think like six secrets have been drawn by both players <laughs> by turn five. It's a ridiculous amount of secrets being thrown <laughs> around. I don't even have any left. Maybe one counter spell. Uh, yeah, seems nice. like it. So um, I guess that's going to be the secret of choice this turn. Going into turn six, there could be uh, the Cabal Crystal Runner coming down soon, Not or true. maybe a Corridor Creeper as well. So the Explosive Runes, while it wouldn't be getting in much face damage, actually seems like a pretty good way to lock this down. And then maybe on the following turn, you go for Counterspell to deny the File and Portal. Uh, right. yeah. But at the same time, he really wants to save the coin for, as you said, Coin yes, File and Portal. It's actually just a lot of first world problems for Aaron here. <laughs> like, I have good counterplay to everything and my own really good play the next turn. So in this case, though, I think that a possible Corridor Creeper is scarier than um, a Firelands coming down at 7. So right. I like the proactive, more proactive choice of secret here. So do I. And for G9, he's finally massive, managed to wrestle back board control for the moment. But there is a moment there's still really strong counterplay available to him. Point Firelands. Uh, just going face here is absurdly powerful. Nothing gets to stick on this kind of board, huh? Ruins everywhere, <laughs> everything's a landmine. These poor minions. Ooh. So, still thinking it's Firelands here, though. Yeah, I would agree with you. He's got plenty of cards in hand at the moment. He doesn't want to be taking uh, damage from cards like Sorcerer's Apprentice when he can pull so far ahead onto the board already with Firelands Portal. Or maybe even outside of that, he could just go for I a Frostbolt to take it out and develop a secret. Uh, but as you said, it's just such a powerful turn six play. Yeah, I think everything else is a little bit too passive, and mm -hmm. giving up the tempo while he's so far ahead doesn't make sense to me. Um, if he plays a Luna, though, do you think he's trying to maybe draw into more burns, seeing that G9's only on 16, and he's got Ice Block what in hand, do? maybe he can just morph into what a Freeze Mage and have at it? He's definitely getting to that point where he can just start going for the burn plan because he knows that the secret in play for G9 uh, was generated off a glyph. So it's unlikely to be the ice block which would really put hamper to his plan of burn. Uh, but at the same time, as you said, Firelands Portal still keeps up with the burn plan. And maybe it's better to go for the Alunath because it does allow him to go for a much higher draw option and go for that burn. Instead, it looks like he's too afraid of Spellbender to go for Firelands Portal, even though that would still develop a much stronger board. Not too sure about this. I was thinking that maybe even the Firelands Portal will find out goes in face. Mm, me too. Um, but maybe Aaron's thinking that he can pretty solidly outvalue uh, G9 in this case as well, being at a higher health total, having refill in the form of mm. Alaneth. So. I'd like to see how Aaron follows up with this plan, but again, I don't know, I just really like Firelands Portal. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very powerful indeed, and I think it is, as you said, now Aaron's game to lose. He's in a really great spot here with the Ice Block as well, which means he can pretty much ignore board for the moment, as long as he thinks he's got enough burn to close what it to out. Do? But at the same time, do? he goes for, what, Portal now, and then a Lunar Frostbolt on the following turn. He needs to be kind of careful, I suppose, about falling behind on board. Do you think this is a bit too cautious in terms of board control? This is super passive. Um, I think that if G9 were to draw Alaneth at this point, he might have um, oh, right. given a window for uh, G9 to go for. Slash value plan. Wow, Burgly Bullies 
one of the best you can get. Pretty good, yeah. Could allow for a pyroblast on the following turn, which then leads into a fireball on the turn yeah. after. So it's uh, obviously with the ice block in play for Aaron, not lethal available over the next couple of turns, but an ice block pop is pretty scary for him indeed. Uh, given that Aaron's been playing so passively, I think he's just going to want to clean up this burgly bully. Mm -hmm. But that involves using two spells to fully get rid of it, the coin and the fire lens. So that means that... G9 will be able to pop block over two turns, which Aaron won't be able to do from what you can see in his hand, and that is a really bad five drop. That is a really, really bad five drop, but that's kind of what you need to expect in this new meta. You can't rely on getting a really powerfully stated minion to pull you through because there are just so many awful, awfully statted cards. Right, recruit as a keyword has diluted um, the stat line of mi that you would expect exactly. from minions of that cost. Feels sharp, man. Haha, <laughs> feels bomb squad, man. <laughs> That's an old card, but well, if I am G9, I see one place, and it is the face here. Yeah, I think I would have to agree with you. Maybe he's going with the same thinking of, well, Aaron's playing very passively to, uh, to try and gain back board control. So what does that say about his hand? It's probably not too burst heavy. Uh, so maybe because of that, he feels able to start going more aggressive, pushing these spells to face, because he knows he's likely not going to be dying over the next mm. couple of turns. Yeah, he did see Aaron toss, what was it, a Frostball, a Fireball, and a Fire Lance? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure about the Fireball, but it was a lot of a burn lot of stuff. that went into minions that, honestly, I think they shouldn't have. So I'd like to see this Fire go straight to face. Promise the bo block top the next turn, and you can hopefully draw into. To do. We have more. So I think this line of play works in effectively the same way if he were to go to the for the fireball as well, but doesn't even want to get two turn block pop. Both of these players uh, playing to a play style that I know you are not too fond of in yeah. not going for the face. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I haven't played too much of the Mage Mirror here, and we have Caster Vision as always, mm -hmm. but. Um, given that Aaron saw the block already, oh, mm. rather, um, he saw a bunch of secrets played already, and mm. I think a block would have been played there for G9 if he had it. Yeah. Really would have wanted to see more burn. And on the flip side, given that G9 saw that Aaron used so much burn, I think he could be not too scared about a 2-4 on board. Well, I think for the main, the most, the thing I disagree with most from both of them, oh. the they've allowed their opponent to draw a Luna, and once a Luna is drawn, it would have been fantastic for both of these players. Yeah. Obviously, unfortunately for G9, he doesn't have that possibility, but Aaron has found that, and now all of a sudden, he will very likely be drawing into a ridiculous amount of burn. So if G9 had Pyro the previous turn, the block would be popped this turn, and to be fair to G9, he wouldn't have had the damage to get rid of that last 5 damage, mm -hmm. so he would have to rely on a top deck, and the punish for that is that he would have taken 4 more damage from the minion remaining. So in that world, Aaron actually would have had I wonder. very close to lethal, but not quite, between the two okay. valets and fireball. So That's a good point. Really still not sure what's going on, but if you're Aaron, your hand is minions at this point, so now you just go in with the minions. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at this in this turn on what double apprentice, double valet, fireball for two mana, fills out your 10 mana perfectly, and you're putting your opponent out for health, which means a frostbolt off the top would just close out the game instantly, as well as any of your other burns, Excuse and me. you've got a ridiculously you wide board to boot as well. Excuse yep. me. And of course, as you know too well, this kind of doesn't run in any. Um, natural AoE. And even if G9 were to spend the turn dealing with the board, Aaron still has um, a bunch of damage to follow up. So. Yeah, he's still got a Luna, which will very likely be drawing him into mm -hmm. a crazy amount of spells. Uh, I suppose doesn't necessarily have to go for the fireball this turn because it will probably get the job done with whatever's drawn off the top. But this does mean that if it is cleared, Fireland Portal wouldn't be an out, I suppose, for Aaron. Ooh, that is a freeze. And that does actually mean that he can't deliver lethal on the following turn, which... So... Oh no, of course, sorry, there's still the mana reduction, so he is going to be dead anyway. So almost an out there, perhaps, for yeah. Aaron, as he is a little bit, again, passive with his burn plan. But in the end, it works out for him anyway with having the mana reduction, getting those down the turn earlier. He's realized that it wouldn't have, it would have to be more than just a freeze. It would have to be something like a flame strike or a blizzard. But I still think there was maybe the potential for him throwing away lethal potential there. Yeah, I'm sorry about being a bit quiet, but this game has been really weird, I gotta say. Um, 
maybe these players have been a little bit too much to heart what we said about remove the mage's minions. Right. That way they can't kill you. But that obviously doesn't apply if you yourself are a mage. That means you can't kill them. That's right. It seems very often in this meta, one of the best game plans you can go for is actually not to kill minions in the later game. It's just to ignore everything that's going on because as priest, you can just do that and kill them with uh, the Anduin hero power against Warlock. You want to be just ignoring their Void Lords a lot of the time and firing off all burn spells that you possibly can towards the face. Uh, but as the mage is there, perhaps taking a slightly too passive line of play, so although it is out of the way for Aaron, for G9, he might have to step up his play and go a bit more aggressive in later games. Right. Although in terms of the lineup builds, I don't think that this match loss is too um, painful for okay. G9 because I feel like that mage was going to get a win at some yeah. point. Unexpected for it to win the mirror in such a fashion, but yeah. uh, it was going to get a win somewhere given that um, Malagos' G9 has a Warlock and a really slow Druid. And this Druid, I want to talk about it because we saw from Kunet a while ago, yes. I believe as well, it makes me think that these two are practice partners because they're not only just running Quest Mali Druid, they're running a very similar build of it with Ixlid, Fungal Lord, very, very greedy, no spreading plague. No spreading plague, that's the big one. And it's not going to be quite so bad when you're up against a mage because, uh, well, even though that's already out of the way because it doesn't go for so many minions wide on the board. And so it's not going to be too bad in this instance for G9, but I think it's maybe just not quite going to get the job done because it is so weak against these aggressive decks. Right, I guess these two players, Koenat and G9, were really expecting a slower meta, right. trying to target some more um, maybe warlocks and deal well against priests. Right. Uh, but at the, I suppose at the same time, for... Uh, Aaron here, he has got the only really aggressive deck left out of the way because now it's only Razakas Priest and the Warlock left for him. So maybe in this particular game it will work out pretty nicely for G9 as he gets a very nice hand full of ramp to get things going. Jungle Giants ready to go as soon as Oaken summons, Cursed Disciple, Corridor Creeper is picked up. That's a lot of cards you mentioned, but then I, I do see this game plan working out. I feel like this might be the only game of the tournament that we get to see this kind of build of Mali Druid um, shine. We have Tice also bringing a Mali Druid, but with a drastically different build. Yes, I believe that's more of a kind of big Druid with Oak Heart and the Drakari Enchanter and all that nonsense right. with Sleepy Dragon. <laughs> so... For Aaron, I think he can expect to lose this matchup and not feel too bad about it, the same way that G9 yep. probably doesn't feel too bad about losing to Mage, because for Aaron, he's really trying to get the wins against the Warlock that okay. uh, G9 has. Priest, of course, favored with being able to pew, pew, pew with that Priest. <laughs> Interesting keeps here for Aaron. I know that when I was talking to Orange, a very skilled Kazakas Priest player, he's a big fan of keeping uh, the Curious Glimmer quite a lot of the time. When you're not on the coin there, though, maybe it's a slightly more difficult decision. Uh, but keeping the Power Word Shield as well, it obviously gives you cycle, but you have to find a minion to stick it on first. Right, I really don't like that keep. Um, of hmm. course, Aaron is actually a bit rewarded for it because he has a right. Radiant to <laughs> pair with it, and of course, a 2512, the Druid is never dealing with that. So he essentially has a disc count on all of his spells for pretty much what four turns it's true but at the same time yeah. in this kind of deck you kind of want radiant for your vellum combo maybe i'm being a bit greedy there but with this druid deck it can gain a very high amount of armor with oaken summons and malfurion uh, actually i stand corrected malfurion is not even in this deck list what's going on with this deck <laughs> it just seems honest. like such an auto include i didn't even consider checking yeah, it's and not even I got earthen scale so we really can't call this a big druid in all respects yeah okay so maybe it's just a mali combo here yeah with, uh, some bigger minions to kind of help it stay alive and activate the quest of course but it's not got those big heavy heading dragons that we're used to and this is, if he knows the deck lists, which are open, he will be picking Ixlid Fungal Lord here. But Fandral is, a, is a really strong bait, I gotta say. That's, That's one of the best baits you can get. But Aaron has done his homework, of yeah. course. Yeah, without a Malfurion in the deck and the Mile Keepers, it's even less incentive to be sticking Fandral in your deck. Um, and obviously, you don't want to be summoning it with the Oaken Summons. You'd much rather get that Cursed Disciple to really start completing your quest as quickly as possible. So are you liking the Pyro Silence here? Um, I think it puts quite a bit of damage on board. And as a priest, I think you kind of got to be the aggressor. Because as okay. you said, the Druid has um, a lot of arm to gain that yeah. you can't really just rely on the one big Valen combo to get you there at the end. And the fact that Aaron has curved out so well, I'd like to see him continue with that game plan. I mean, there's... there's 
positives and negatives for the game plan you're thinking of sure. because obviously there is no Malfurion in the deck list so the, the armor either, game yeah. is yeah no well the plague is kind of to go for the other play for the Malfurion you don't really need to get the chip damage in because Velen will probably just kill them off uh, but because there's no plague you can feel pretty comfortable in going really wide on the board getting the value out of these cards like Wild Pyro when you can um, and silencing off that second completion of the quest is a really nice way to maybe uh, slow down what the druid is doing but at the same time the quest completion isn't really so much what you're afraid of it's more ultimate infestation once that does hit the board you're very likely to be uh, having the quest completed on the next couple of turns anyway yeah. um, the point you made about saving the radiant makes a lot of sense because it's easily worth a damage when it's in that con combo and makes things cheaper but i really like the fact that since aaron already went in with the minion curve just going uh Staying true to that game plan with playing more minions and just getting in as much damage as possible mm. makes sense to me. I think you play to the hand you have and did like that. It's a little weak to swipe, but oh well, how are you going to play around it anyway? Yeah, that's kind of what I was going to say is that once swipe comes down here, it could completely clear the board if it were in uh, G9's hand, obviously. It would be pretty bad for Aaron because all of a sudden, what's he doing on the following turn? Just playing Priest of the Beast is decent, but he really needs to hit that card draw most importantly. Uh, but arguably even worse for him here, G9 has got an incredible ramp hand, can't quite get to uh, UI on the following turn because Coin Jade Blossom would not make a difference. He could go up to nine mana maximum either way. Uh, but either way, this is a very nice way for G9 to get things going and will very probably have a quest completion in the next couple of turns. Yeah, and we get to see the pew 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 that I just really want to see this deck shine <laughs> at least once. That's my mistake. The priest does the pew pew pew. The druid does more of like a boom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and for Aaron there, um, nice for uh, G9 to recognize that, of course, the pyro is more important to clear off. Now the loot hoarder is actually just not going to be drawing a card. So I actually wonder if Aaron would just use his paint on it to start hmm. cycling more, of course, after attacking. Oh. I think it's very possibly going to be saved for a little longer because there are kind of targets you want to hit. Just, actually, no, there aren't really any targets you want to be hitting in the druid with that yeah. Shadow Word Pain. So yeah, maybe you do just go for it or maybe more likely save for the Gadgets and Auctioneer later on down the line. But the parts of the combo are starting to be assembled here for G9. He just needs to find a way to complete that quest. Maybe with the Corridor Creepers later on, another Cursed Disciple would be a very strong way of making sure he can lock out this game. Because although he is looking in a very favorable spot, after he's played UI, he doesn't guaranteed have quest completion. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't have too strong follow-up in terms of draw, it's not a Jade deck where he can just start throwing stuff out and probably win anyway. He does need to find those all-important combo pieces. Right, he'll have to take at least um, another turn to play the Swipe as well to clear the whole board because having played the Ixlid, Aaron can just get two Priest of the Feast here. I think that's pretty good. So, um, yeah, I just think it's going to be definitely minion pressure here for Aaron. He doesn't have what he needs to go for the combo. I guess I expect the Hoarder to trade into the Ix at least hmm. to find something to do first. Really? I think I'm reckoning when we see a Shadow and Pain coming down here because there's really nothing else you want to see. And he's going with True. a tempo line of play. And to be honest, it's kind of working out for him for the okay. moment. Uh, he just needs to make sure he's not setting up too strongly into ultimate infestation because I think he can very strongly expect to see that coming down on the following right. turn. One. Sure, so then the hoarder trades into the 1-1. One, one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, makes more sense. So that definitely should happen first if he's going to go for the trade at all. Maybe he's going to go for the one. Yeah, I think probably the trade there would first would have been better because if you can get double Raza perhaps instead of double Priest of the Beast, that would be even more pressure, which is really what you want to be hitting. But here he's saying every single point of attack matters. I'm just going all in on damage. And even here with the ultimate infestation, it's a really nice way to start pushing out uh, G9 from this, uh, stop pushing Aaron out from this game. There's still a respectable amount of damage coming through. Double Raza, shouldn't that make your hero power cost negative two? <laughs> Gain mana over here. Nah. So, I like the way you think. As we mentioned, the is the way that Aaron's been able to have uh, some counterplay in this game. This is the one turn that 
um, G9 has needed to take and be slow, basically. Right. You need to take that one turn to fill your hand and get ready for the combo. And so I guess maybe that makes sense why Aaron has kept the loot order, because technically it's still just two damage on board every turn. Yeah, maybe absolutely. you're not looking for the extra card draw, you just want to keep pushing face. Yeah, it's going to die eventually, isn't it? So you may as well get the damage in while you can. And that was a follow-up here for G9. He's thinking, is it worth going for the naturalize? He is facing down how much? 13. 13 so one damage. mind blast would have done it. Wow, so. okay. Yeah. Okay, I think I can actually respect this line of play yeah. because the Master Spell's been there for a while. Maybe that's just a Mind Blast that managed to find its way in. But even here, this is still a lot of damage if the Mind Blast is picked up. Yeah, at the same time, just giving Priest draws. You're giving right. them what exactly. they want more than exactly. anything. Exactly. So in that case, if you're Aaron, do you just try and dig for that burst damage here? I won. Um, if you vision into Mind Blast, Master Spell, and get the other Mind Blast. <laughs> no, that seems a little bit too wild. <laughs> I think he's trying to find how do I best keep my draw up whilst also keeping pressure on the board because he's realizing, to be honest, at this point, I'm unlikely to deliver lethal in the next couple yeah. of turns. So he needs to set up a longer term game plan. And what that means is finding something like Spirit Lash to go with the Acolyte of Pain. Maybe a wild, py oh no, the wild pyro has already come down, but making sure you are getting yourself closer to Anduin because while he was very low on cards a couple of turns ago, if he finds Raza or Anduin now, it's actually going to be some repetitive damage starting to rack up quite quickly. In that regard, it definitely has to be more cards here like this. Uh, more cards than draw cards, basically. Right. And I really just don't think uh, G9 has the time. Really? It just seems insane that Priest can, uh, the Druid, oh sorry, the Priest can do such a good job of playing onto the board. Um, there is the ability for Malagos double Moonfire to come down here and take out a lot of what is going on for Aaron, and he is going to go with this play. If there's no silence available, the swipe will completely destroy what Aaron is doing. But as you correctly pointed out, that master spell will come in massively here to just to take out the effect of that Malagos. But still, a four nine is not to be sniffed at. Yeah, um, the way that the game played out, that the Malagos oh, did not uh, get affected by a quest completion, means that G9 actively gave up his OTK win condition, right. exposing himself to a silent effect, and I think wanted, because if OTK potential for it, I think you're just pretty much able to deal with it as you would any other deck as Priest, which is you have answers for everything, right. so you win in the long run. Ooh, Psychic Scream, one mana off even being playable if you wanted to just straight up get rid of that Malagos. Has he still got the Radiant on board, or is it gone? Uh, the Radiant, oh, good question. I believe it's, uh, it's been no, taken it's off now, yeah, yeah, from the Moonfires. So. Even so, I'm not sure how much you want to Psychic Scream the Malagos back into the deck. Like, I feel a Master Spell is fine here. You're not too upset about taking 11. I think I like this as a follow-up, though, because that 4-9, yeah. uh -huh. you just don't have a way to deal with it for a, such a long time unless you get rid of it right now. So even, as you said, he does have the Master Spell available right now. Because he's got in so much pressure in the early turns, it looks like once uh, Shadow Reaper Anduin comes down, maybe in combination with a Raza, he can just close out the game in the next couple of turns. Yeah, I, I mean, G9 gave up his win condition essentially yeah. with that comp, uh, using the Moonfire right away. Of course, he couldn't have gotten the whole combo without having the Malagos boost. So, um, Aaron's early minion pressure forced G9 into that position. The spell is really inefficiently, and it's really just a matter of time now. Anduin comes down. Gets in. It is worth pointing out again, we criticized him for his keep for power word shield at the start of the game. And whilst in the majority of cases it might not work out, in this instance, it allowed him to go for this aggressive tempo game plan, which very often is just not an ability for Priest. Right. I still don't think it was right, though. Okay. Keep, okay. Keeping oh, yeah. shield. Nah, I can get behind keeping Radiant with shield. Well, right. actually, I agree with that. Keeping Radiant on its own may be a bit questionable, right. but, well, things have worked out here. And it is worth pointing out again, I suppose, that once Psychic Scream comes I down and won. shuffles Malagos back into the deck, the win condition is then active once again, in combination with perhaps another swipe that could come down later on. There are cards that work in combination with it, maybe an ultimate infestation as well for 10 damage. Could come on later down the line, but that probably won't come into effect. Well, are we psychic screaming? How bad is Anduin here? Yes, it does activate quests and leave nine on board, but are you that scared when you're at 23? You've still got death, I suppose. Yeah, you can start pinging away. You've got Holy Smite and Mind Blast. 
He's just trying to figure out if he'll have lethal on the following turn. If he does go for Shadow Reaper and Wind Defeat. Not Seven. Not Raza, so. Right, okay. Hmm. So it will be the Psychic Scream. And funny the way things should work out. Although Malagos can be cheaper, uh, Aaron realizes that double moon fire is actually a bit easier. So this does make sense. Yeah, and now the Can't question... Can't be ODK'd anyway. That's true. So it is basically just going to be through minion pressure that Aaron will be losing the game at this point, most likely. If at all. If at all, yeah, exactly. That's the win condition for G9 in this instance. And with Barnabas the Stomper coming down, that is a... Stomper. What's it actually called? Just Barnabas, right? It has a name. It's like Barnabas... Uh, he stomps. Did you not see him walk across the can, board? We can call him the Stomper. Sure, okay. sure. And unfortunately, the Stomper will be stomped by one really insane Anduin this turn. Yeah, this Anduin is the real Stomper in this instance. There is nothing that you might do against this. You know, sits back. Well, what are you going to do? Sometimes they just have the Anduin. And this has been kind of... This is what Aaron was going for with this game plan. He's going for getting in a good amount of damage early on. I don't think he was expecting to be winning the game uh, through early minion tempo, but just making sure that once his uh, Anduin does come down, he can just get in those repetitive hero powers and close out the game incredibly quickly. I was just going to say that without some massive armor gain yep. for Gina, he was just dead to Vela and Mind Blast and lose Lost. my butt. Ultimate Infestation was absolutely the best draw wow. in that deck. And he can now put down a lot of big boys, huh? Yeah, Corridor Creeper, Caustic Zero, even though no minions have died, just through the power of Barnabas, means that this is a ridiculously powerful board here. Lethal represented on the very following turn, unless something very impressive can come down here for Aaron. Well, he can go for... He can set up his own lethal on the backswing, given no yep. armor gain, uh, aside from the hero power, which is like ping, spirit lash, and ping. Well, death. Okay. Two ping, <laughs> spirit lash, and death. It all fits, right? In some order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I like that line of and play. And given that two moon fires have been used, you're only and one swipe, right? Yes. Okay, so what, only one swipe is what you're scared of. So if you use death, you leave nine, uh, 14 on board, and then swipe is still lethal. With spirit lash, you go to 24. Um, Shh, yeah, swipe, swipe is still. Yeah, lethal. with hero power, I think it's right. Exact. Yeah, exactly. So, I think you kind of, I mean, if you figure out that it is exactly lethal either way, maybe if you can fit in, the shadows grow you can go for a binding heal yeah. instead of another ping. Does that still yeah. set up lethal with Velen, Holy Smite, Mind Blast? Uh, the thing is, you, you, very need difficult at, yeah, you need him at 13, right? Because you expect at least one armor again yeah. and Mind Blast. Holy Smite with Velen's obviously 14. So I don't think everything we mentioned is doable in this turn. You can't play around everything while setting up your own lethal. Right. So Aaron just decides instead to hunt for what I think was exactly the second second stream or Raza and, and he hit both. So. He manages to find both, as you said, which is very, very nice indeed. Right. So for D9, now he's digging for swipe with Nourish, right? Uh, just to close out the game at that point. Uh, 14 plus... Four Would it plus be five. one off? Yeah, it's actually one off. So... Oh, wait. Branching? Did you miss something? This still isn't enough, right? It would add six damage, 12 damage to the board. I think oh, that might actually oh just be gosh. lethal with doubles. Wow. Oh, thinking about swipe when the answer was right <laughs> in front of us. Classic, classic casters, absurd. huh? Yeah. What could possibly have been done? Like, Aaron in that game, he got off to such a strong tempo start, which is not something we recommended or were expecting even. Swing back from the Druid was just able to push him back into the game, but we were still thinking that that just wasn't going to be there for G9 because Aaron had such strong ability once he found that Shadow Reaper and win. But even then, it just wasn't quite there for him. Yeah, I was floored by that. Did Aaron have any instance where you could have put on more pressure and not given time to complete the quest? Not too sure, but really that ultimate infestation draw came absolutely at the right time for G9 there. But we can't say that we weren't expecting the Druid to take a win at some point. If it was going to in this tournament, it would be against a Priest. So now uh, we got to see some interesting Druid action. Not quite the way we expected with and the I, Moonfire combo, but I, I appreciated that. Yeah, I did as well. I think this is not only important in the context of this game, but also showing that while the quest was important there, there was really strong ability throughout that game, even with just the ultimate infestation. Throwing down the Malagos, there, is, there are win conditions there, even without the quest. So against the Hunter deck we saw from Kuanet early on, maybe should have been throwing away the quest a little bit earlier, but in that particular match, obviously against the Priest, the quest can do truly tremendous things, especially in combination with the branching paths.
Yeah, branching paths, I didn't realize how much burst it actually provides. When you have two minions on board, it's four mana deal four. When yeah. it's on with three, it's a fireball. So with two of them, it's two fireballs. Huh. That's the actual secret burst of this deck. It's not the Moonfire Malagos. You wouldn't expect it to be when there's not even any spreading plagues in the deck. Uh, but now that that's out of the way, I think Aaron will be feeling a little bit better because his Warlock is probably in a slightly better spot up against this mage. Uh, it's not a fantastic matchup for the Warlock, especially when it's not a super anti-aggro version from Aaron with the cube lock rather than the slightly uh, more controlly lock we see from Firebat and Purple, but it's still going to have a decent chance with Plated Beetle and Nazoth. This is quite a strange hybrid. Right, yeah, this isn't pure Control Warlock. It's the Cube Nazoth version, which right. I think has a good balance of anti-aggro tools. Okay. Um, just because Plated Beetles, it's a good card, huh? Just a two, It's a River Croc, but it's got a decent upside, which synergizes with Nazoth. It makes a lot of sense in this... Um, kind of matchup, so I'd say that Iron's in a pretty good position as long as he can space out the threat, um, the AoE properly and play around secrets, of course. You don't want to be playing your Spellstone into a counter spell. That's absolutely right. Counter spell can be kind of difficult to play around in this matchup because while Dark Pact is obviously a pretty nice way to cheaply get rid of it, if there's a lot of burn in your opponent's hand, Dark Pact can actually be one of the best spells in your so arsenal to so just pull your yourself out of range minutes. after you've thrown down a Void Lord, maybe in combination with the Lackey if you're lucky. Is that intentional there? Lackey if you're lucky? I kind of realized I was going to do it again for the second time a few seconds before I said it. All right, so G9 really not picking up what he wanted to. A minion on two is a welcome sight. It is relatively relatively fragile, but mm -hmm. wow, without something like Kirin Tor to follow up, he might be forced to go for a throw burn at the face early game plan, which sometimes Mage is just honestly forced to do. Um, you can't give the Warlock enough time that they build up their own minion board to enough healing. Sometimes you just go for a very, uh, what most people think is a rank 5 play of Fireball on 3 or 4, <laughs> as it turns out. Aaron presented with a really difficult choice here because, first of all, he doesn't even know what this secret is. And maybe he's just thinking, I mean, if this was a uh, runes, perfect. I just throw down my Lackey on turn 5, it blows up, and I hopefully get a Void Lord out of my deck to prevent some of this damage. Uh, but if it's the counter spell, he kind of wants to get the Defile down, I suppose, so he can sure. activate the Spellstone. But he doesn't know what's in his opponent's hand. Maybe it is just a bunch of minions, in which case the Defile would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, not just getting the counter spell out of the way from the spells, but I think for Hellfire is really important. Right, because okay. if you expect a Kirin Tora mage to come down, Hellfire is the best way to get rid of all of that minion pressure. And again, remove the mage's minions, put them only on burn spells, and you are pretty much stabilized. So do you like that play of going for the Defile there to test yeah, the secret? Yeah, I do like it. Okay. Because how much work is Defile doing anyway on its own? Um, without me. Lackey, you, you need fire. a Mortal Coil in combination with it, which is not in hand for Aaron, so don't mind that at all. Exactly. Yeah. Without even Blood Mage Thalmos in the deck as well, it's difficult to get value against this mage. Right. So now Hellfire goes down every day of the week here. <laughs> yeah, very nice easy play, and with no minion follow-up whatsoever, even off the top for G9. <laughs> it's going to have to Called just it. be a 5 4 on 4 kind of game. Yeah. He's got plenty of burns to start closing out this game. However, Aaron has plenty of heal on the backswing to start fighting back against what G9 is trying to accomplish. Right. It's going to be an easy lackey here, right? Then you can cube and pack to the next turn. Nice and simple. You're not scared of oh, dying so from 14. Come right, on. Yeah. <laughs> one turn five. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, he knows there's no way he can die here, so this is definitely the way to go about it. And that is not a good card to find at the <laughs> top either for G9. He just hasn't found the follow-up to his early tempo plays, which is what you kind of need against the Warlock. Because around turns three and four, once they've done their Hellfire or Defile clear, you need to get in that couple extra turns of minion damage before they go Lackey into Void Lord, and you're never going what to face again do? in your life. So if he plays Ruins and fits in a ping here, I guess the next turn is Fireball Frostbolt, and then the following is Firelands. Does that get him there from his perspective? It does. He has 14 in hand, but you can never put the Warlock on not having healing. Yeah, exactly. It's not even having yeah. cast vision here. It's just he needs to assume there's some mm. kind of healing in the deck, because even with uh, the Plated Beetle thrown in there as well, there's so much potential for armor gain for Aaron in this, uh, in this particular game. So I think... While G9 might just be expecting there to be heal, he's kind of not in a spot where he can play around that. He just needs to go for the face burn plan. And he 
totally recognizes that. I guess this is a better <laughs> way of doing it um, fit in the fireball now. Uh, the possible now, mm -hmm. so you can fireball ping and then Firelands portal. But, well, Dark Pack's a good card. Um, this does make Aaron scared of second counter spell, is the thing. Yeah, Dark Pact is an incredibly powerful card. But as you said, it's a really nice play from G9 to make him a little bit afraid. Uh, but Aaron could potentially go for Carnivorous Cube beforehand, uh, or the Faceless Manipulator even, to try and bait out the explosive runes. Carnivorous Cube kind of makes a good amount of sense because you're copying two lackeys, which isn't fantastic, but just absorbing all the damage from the explosive runes is a really nice way to make sure that Dark Pack pulls you out of range. Right, I like the cube here because um, they're still lackeys at some point. They're yeah. going to die and still pull <laughs> the immediate so I mean, the threats, even though they aren't immediate. It's the thing that I think is important for Aaron here is if he thinks that's counterspell, how is the best way to play around it? And okay. I think he still has to dark pack in that case because if it's counterspell, well, at some point you really need to heal within the next few turns. So it's not like you have a different spell to activate it. So get it out of the way now so your spell zone is active the next turn. He just goes for it right off the gate. This is not the play we were looking at because... Oh, this makes more sense. Oh. In a way, but if it was the counterspell, he kind of wants the information first of all by going for the cube. And if he goes for the attack in cubes and then goes for the Dark Pact on his own cube, he can pull out two extra lackeys, which will get him a whole bunch of other minions, uh, other demons from his deck. And then he can start pushing for Doomguard lethal, as we do see this is... Oh, no, I apologize. It's a carnivorous cube variant without Doomguards. Yeah. So, in this case, I still think Aaron has it every day of the week. Uh, maybe the one day G9 pulls out, uh, pulls ahead is to draw Alaneth and then into a bunch more burn spells. Right. But at the same time, it's not like Aaron's not doing anything. I think I this turn will be Taldoram plus possibly a Spellstone. Yeah, I think that's the way this is going to be going. He can... The thing is, with no other spells in hand, he doesn't even want to wait around and give his opponent a chance for other counter spell. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He does want to take out an opposing minion with the Spellstone here. Obviously targeting one of his own guys is kind of bad. We're just going for Taldoram Spellstone. It leaves him with more stuff on board than he had beforehand. It's not bad at all. Yeah, I think it's totally fine. Like, you attack with a 3-3 three, three board lord and get rid of it. You still have that 3 damage on board in the form of the Death Rattle. Um, then again, you're probably not dying from 12 after you've seen the Fireball. Yeah, on 7 mana. Yeah. You can. You wouldn't be dead quite yet, but there is the coin still available, so maybe if it's the perfect combination of cards. But it's not worth playing around it because of that. It's more a long-term setup, guaranteeing you the ability to get in this Spellstone here. It's perhaps, it's arguably too cautious of a play, but I think it still sets up a good amount of pressure on board, and it means that G9 knows there's no way he can push through all this damage. He doesn't want to hang around for a Luna, because the thing is, if he played it on the following turn, he'd be doing nothing. Board, the Void Lords just overrun him and he'd be dying to an opposing lethal from his opponent. Right, it was a million different ways of dying for G9 there and he just didn't want to extend it any longer than it had to be. So that means we will be going into game four, I believe. Yes, and it's kind of becoming apparent for G9 why the ban of Rogue was so effective from his opponent because with the quest, Ro uh, sorry, the quest Druid able to get a very easy win earlier on, it means he's able to clear up against these uh, slightly more targeted decks from his opponent in things like the Priest and the Warlock, which are still yet to be taking a win. Right. So I want to talk about how both these players represent their countries coming into here as well. Um, I need to fit in a little bit of SEA plug. <laughs> Come on. So Aaron is somebody who has had more... Um, I'd say international recognition yep. in previous years and this is an event where he might be coming back to make a name for himself. The timing of this tournament is really interesting not just because it's Christmas and not just because we're in the middle of or in the what kind of early stages of the new expansion where right. it's not too much of a clown fiesta but lots of things can change and we're also just going into the new um, tournament structure for 2018 right. and all of these players I'm sure are looking to qualify next year and so getting early experience in this expansion could be really really useful and of course getting that exposure trying to get teams and things like that it's really important i think that's one of the biggest things with the recent reveals of how team-based tournaments are going to be working the extra rewards for putting forward uh, players on your team as a trio these players are definitely been wanting to find those big team names uh, and get themselves in a really strong uh, point in their hearthstone career before we enter the 2018 structure and i think 
for uh, Aaron here. He's looking to be in a pretty good spot to be pulling this back. He's taking some wins now with the rest of his decks and maybe with his remaining deck of the Kazakh Priest. Priest. Yeah. Yes, he's in a good spot to take out a couple of decks from his opponent with that. Right. It's a good feeling, right? To only have a Priest left. He's like, oh, yeah. great. <laughs> this is what I do every day on that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thing, so. All right. Kazaka is in the opening. Great for Aaron. I'd be really shocked for him to keep shield again in this date, in this matchup, though. Yeah, I think he's looking to keep Kazakas and probably just nothing else because he really yep. wants to find that Raza Anduin combo as quickly as he can. And Kazakas is one of the best ways to allow him to do that. And looking at this matchup for Aaron, I think it's going to be a pretty favorable one to hopefully close things out for his sake. There is the ability... I'm, okay, so I'm saying q -block is not a good matchup for Priest, and I still stand by that. But if you are going to be taking down a Kazakas Priest with a Control Warlock, this is the way to do it. You've got Double Mountain Giant, you've got the Cube Skull of Minari Doom Guard combo, which is a great way to apply a lot of pressure, but you have to be hitting those on curve. Right, you took basically all the words out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> Mountain Giant is, I think, a very conscious inclusion um, in these Control Warlocks to have some sort of game against Priest. You don't want to be sitting around and relying on yeah. a really niche Doom Guard combo that can requires a lot of cards to have. Um, at the same time, Priest is still Priest, of course, and we can see two of the key cards, um, Kazakas and Anduin, are in hand for Aaron. So thinking he's looking pretty favored from the get-go. I agree, and I think for G9, this play Mount of keeping back the Mistress of Mixtures is a really nice way yes. to get things going, because obviously the old handlock days kicking in, and you will remember that uh, going for tap, tap, giant on four is the way the maths has to work out, not playing any other cards when you're going first. Uh, so he is clearly setting up for that play of trying to slam down the trying to slam down the Mountain Giant as well, quickly as he can. Right, and Aaron now, having seen that there was no one drop for G9, I think it makes sense for him to hold back the Cleric as right. well. It definitely has more value than dealing one a turn against Warlock when it's going to heal back at that point anyway. A lot of the times in this matchup, the minion damage that the Priest might be able to deal doesn't really matter because the Warlock can like heal right mind. back up and the Priest doesn't care when they have the full combo. They can deal 30, upwards of 30 pretty easily. That's exactly right. I think it was Wabika Wab uh, Wab on Twitter. I don't know if his name. He was having a very good discussion saying how you combat against this Warlock because you're either doing it through ignoring the board when the Void Lords come down or you're doing it through Spellbreaker. Uh, but it's kind of difficult to know which line of play you need to go for because when you're going for the ignoring the board plan, Mountain Giants make that actually pretty difficult to do so and that's generally Generally what the priest is trying to do once the Void Lords come down, they're probably not going to be removing it outside of a Psychic Scream, and then they hope that the Anduin hero power will simply be closing out the game around turn mm. 13. So, Aaron is on 8 cards here, playing the Acolyte means that there is potential for overdraw, but it's very difficult for G9 to do, so I definitely like just playing it out here. It, the overdraw plan would involve double coil and defile or something, or like a <laughs> kobold defile coil or something like that. Uh, very niche combination of cards, and um, yeah, I think it's better than doing nothing that turn. Uh, Flip side, Keenan's pretty upset to not have a giant here. Even if he did, Aaron has the death, so looking pretty rough for G9 here. Yeah, I think with a full mulligan and tap tap, he was over 50% to be finding that mountain giant by turn 4, so a little bit unfortunate that he didn't manage to get that. And even unfortunate as well that he doesn't even have the backup plan available of so Doomguard and Skull and the Skull with cube stuff available at the moment. Uh, as soon as he finds a Skull and a Doomguard, he's in a much better spot to be doing so. But that's a pretty tall order to be finding in the next few turns. Right, and he does the best play he has, which is pretty cute, to be honest, making a 3-3 <laughs> Acolyte and then cycling your coil. It doesn't feel good, but he really needs to get to those giants. Whereas for Aaron here, he has a many, many different ways to draw. Um, he has to be careful if he's going for some sort of pyro plan with the Acolyte, because overdraw could be the one way he loses to get rid of the Raza. So maybe it's a Kazakus here. Then again, Kazakus just replenishes itself in terms of hand size. That's exactly right. He is going to have to be careful. And, you know, he doesn't want to be just getting one draw off his Acolyte because obviously overdraw is a consideration, but he wants to be cycling as quickly as he can because once he finds that Raza, it is all but a one game for him if he finds it in the next few turns. Um, so making sure he cycles as much as he can is a pretty important way to go about things. So I think because of that, we will be seeing the Wild Pyro come down because he can actually just dump quite a lot of cards from his hand in the process. 
This way he can also fit in a cleric plus heal. I think the Acolyte definitely has to trade in the, at this point because you do not want to be getting more than these two draws with that kind of hand size. And we also get to see a, a one card mill from G9. Maybe if it was the Skull, the Doom Guard, something like that, it could be one of the most powerful ways the Priest is taking this matchup simply closed out. Right, this is yeah, the only play is Hellfire here for G9, but again, being passive against the Priest really sucks because in most matches it's the Priest that needs to be taking that role of reacting to you and clearing the board, and then when you give them time, well, the end is inevitable. He's being passive in a way, I suppose, here, but he is making sure he cycles through his deck to yeah. make sure he does start finding those powerful combo plays. Uh, for example, if he goes for Lackey and pulls something out like the Doom Guard with the Dark Pact, he's not cubing it and makes some really ridiculous I combos happen as soon as long as he is avoiding silence to really close out what he's trying to do. Right. In no way do I say passive, meaning that G9 has played in a passive style what? when he couldn't have. I mean that the draw has been giving him only this choice, which is really unfortunate. So now, I guess Aaron goes for a pretty easy Kazakus here, and this hand is looking very one-mana potion to me. You reckon? Yeah. Wow. I think it's way too full for you to go for a five-mana cost potion. You also have Auctioneer in hand. I can definitely see your reasoning. I think you would you think you make it and then play it straight away just for whatever effect it gives you, like resurrect a minion and draw something like that. Ooh, if it's resurrected, you get scared because it's an acolyte. So oh, that's if that true. comes okay. back, you could be overdrawing. I like a preemptive three damage pick because you're gonna get to that um, Dalen at some point. Wow. This is, I think, an interesting play. I don't, I don't pick one mana potion enough. I think because I would be uh, thinking more along the lines of play of trying to uh, dump your hand of cards like Shadow Word, Pain, and Death, and then redraw with the five mana draw too. But I like the way this works out because with such a heavy hand, you want to have a bit more flexibility yeah. in your play and make sure that as soon as you find Raza and Velen, you can just start pew pewing your opponent down from a very high health total. Right. So Aaron did miss the draw on the options for the one mana potion, which is obviously what he wanted most. So the next turn for him, I feel like, could be really passive. And now that G9 has picked up the Mountain Giant, this could be um, go time. Although, now that I say that, since Aaron really didn't have the space or the mana to go for a big auctioneer turn and probably wouldn't be doing much aside from developing Akane that turn, now he has something to do with Shadow or Death. That's true. Yeah. And going for, you know, Mountain Giant and being met with an instant Shadow of Death, all of a sudden the cube sucks again. Like, you kind of want to be playing Mountain Giant into cube, into Dark Pack, something like that. Or just going Mountain Giant cube so that you have a 4-6 punching them in the face with Giants inside once you've seen a silence effect, maybe. Right, and Genai actually decides to go for the Lackey here. And I think this is um, noting that this is one of his few opportunities on board to play Lackey, whereas when he doesn't have other minions, so it's gotta be Potion of Madness plus something to kill it to totally deny the uh, lackey. So I think um, he recognizes that probably one giant isn't gonna get him there. There's death, there's Anduin at some point. So what he needs to do is get to those doom guards and start cubing them. Unfortunately, Aaron still has the answer because he is busy. He does indeed, but at the same time, for G9, he is baiting out a silence effect, which is really good for him at the moment, because he, I think he's saying with this play, Kabul Lackey uh, into the Dark Pact is, oh sorry, the uh, Possessed Lackey into Dark Pact is a really nice way to put some pressure on the board, but it's not good enough. I need to find something more impressive, and what that probably means is getting Skull of the Minari, Doom Guards, uh, in combination with the Cube and the Dark Pact, and really start pushing a lot of damage, whereas just going for the Lackey into Dark Pact probably would just be met with a swift death. Right, and I can see what you mean about not being good enough, but even though he goes for the play that, or the line that could have won him the game most of the time, this kind of draw from Aaron is really the opposite of not good enough. This is the nuts. <laughs> Raza into Anduin, you don't mind taking 8 damage at all, and then the combo will be online. He's got, I believe he took the damage spell and a bunch of cheap things, and uh, G9, he does have double um, fully evolved. Healing um, spell stones, but it's only going to be a matter of time. I was almost going to disagree with you on the 
player going for Raza here because you are afraid of just the cube coming down to suck up the mountain giant. Uh -huh, and then okay. all of a sudden you don't really have a way of dealing with that. But because of the psychic scream in hand, I think even in that eventuality, uh, if you're really afraid of the giants popping out of the cube, you can just psychic scream them so back into the deck. Maybe at the same time, there's just not enough pressure from a 4-6. So yeah, I think in every way, yeah. this is probably the best play and Anduin will likely just close out the game soon. Yeah, even if the cube were to come down here, you still play Anduin into it, right? It's a 4 yeah, sure. attack. I mean, it doesn't die, so you can just ignore it for as long yeah, as possible. True. And with a dark pack, it's not like the giants have charged, so this just... Yeah, Aaron, everything's working out for him here. <laughs> And yeah, I, I, this play might look ridiculous from Gene because he is going to be absolutely destroyed by Anduin. But I think he's correctly realized if Anduin is here, I lose 100% of yes. the time anyway. Like, there's just no win condition at that point because I will die so, so quickly. My opponent has basically a full hand on top of that. They very likely have Velen or Auctioneer or Radiant Elemental, all these kind of ridiculous cards in combination with Mind Blast that would just close out the game instantly. Mm -hmm. Classic example of playing to your outs. Unfortunately, the out just wasn't there. So, uh, what's it going to be? A two-turn clock for <laughs> G9? Well, it was three damage picked up off the potion as well. Which was <laughs> yeah, four with the blood mage. You've got auctioneer radiant as well, so <laughs> that might not even. We don't need to see Vale in this game, do we? Yeah. And so I think here from uh, G9, it's looking to be some kind of a cube dark pack with Doom Guard play over the next couple of turns, maybe giving him the ability to pull this back. Uh, but we can just see this can be met with a death. It might not even need to be, but I think you'll realize just because of the potential for stupid stuff to happen with Cube and Dark Packs, he can just get rid of this to close out any chance that G9 takes this game. Right, so I cannot see Lethal as far as we're concerned here. He can play Auctioneer, Radiant, Lash, and Kazaka's Potion, so that's... Um, 10 with the pings and then 13 from the potion. So uh, I guess this is one of those priest turns where you just play whatever fat you have in your hand. It's the calm before the storm. Maybe get in a decent <laughs> six damage, sure. And then totally just close it out over the next few turns. So are you liking Akanai? The Talon Priest? I don't know. I'm Maybe. not even sure. I kind of like going for the death just because oh, yeah, it means sure. there's no cube real target, chance of course, yeah. Yeah, for a cube target to be in play. Uh, but yeah, like auctioneer death here is fine. He doesn't even want to go Ooh, for it in the end, okay. which I think is a bit on the hat, really risky. Like you're going to have yeah. answers no matter what, because if they do make a big play, you can go for Psychic Scream. The thing is though, because there's no Umbra in the deck for G9, and Aaron will note that because the deck lists are open, um, it does mean that there's no real ability for Burst Lethal to kill him off in one turn anyway. So just keeping up the draw here gives him the highest chance of killing his opponent on the following turn anyway. Yeah, well, I think there's a million different ways to go about right. this anyway, but I guess it's kind of that old Freeze Mage ideology that if you're up against a deck that has healing, you kind of want to keep them at that sweet spot of around 20 so that they're afraid of dying so they will use their healing inefficiently. Whereas if you bring them a little too low, that healing can get its max value and then maybe you're dealing less damage in the long run. But now that Priest has that Auctioneer and they're able to just keep cycling, the damage comes and it comes and it comes. Yeah, once it starts coming, it comes. <laughs> Unfortunately for G9. And I think this, is, this game might be an indicator of why the strategy uh, of Purple and uh, Firebat are banning away that Priest and hard targeting Warlock is pretty good because Priest, unsurprisingly, has been very effective so far this tournament. It's good against the aggro decks in the Paladins, the Rogues, the Hunters, but it's also really good against um, the control Warlocks that we see here as there is very little opening for, Aaron to be t uh, for G9 to be taking this game. Yeah, this looks like a pretty clear psychic scream to me. I don't want to be deathing here to just to prevent like Gul'dan coming down and then like yeah. two void void uh, doom guards. I'm already confusing their names. <laughs> um, yeah, he's fine with just ping psychic scream, ping, and then play. Glimmer. I, yeah, glimmer, yeah. Sure, makes sense. Something like that seems fine. He's even looking, I guess, to shuffle the glimmer reap back into his opponent's yeah, deck sure. if he does want yeah. to go for the psychic fine. scream. We could very potentially just see a shadow of death, something like that. He's still just in no danger of dying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think this is worth going for anyway. Actually, he found the uh, Glimmer Root Shuffle pretty cute. Although, I guess the three damage on board matters a little bit more than possibly preventing a cooldown draw. Yeah, something like that. 
That Atheon on the pick, though, pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, it was <laughs> I fairly blinked. obvious. One might say, yes, yeah. Sea Devil Stinger, not the most popular sure. choice in Q Block. <laughs> Yeah, and now here for G9, it's still just nothing to be done, really. Double Doom Guard could come down, assuming one isn't discarded already. Push for some damage to face, but this is just not the way you're winning this matchup. The cards he needed uh, just weren't there. You need uh, something like a Mountain Giant, the Cube in combination with the Doom Guard, the Lackeys, the Dark Pack, the Skull of the Minari, and you need it all about turn five or six. If you're not hitting it then, the combos for the Priest just start becoming too powerful because there's Psychic Scream, there's Anduin, there's Dragonfire Potion, all this stuff that just completely completely destroys what the Warlock's trying to do. Yeah, so this turn, I was actually debating uh, if I were in G9's position, if it's Voidlord or Concede. Because he has shown that he concedes really early in other matchups. Um, in this case, though, I think he's found the, maybe the one out that could get him out of it, which is go double Doomguard. Maybe there's no death or convenient answer. And maybe you don't discard that other Doomguard, but of course it's like, I'd say less than 1% that that ever works. I don't think it can ever work, because even if there isn't something like a death or any way to kill this off, just pings and cards. Yeah. Very likely clear off uh -huh. all these Doomguards anyway. So it would have to be that and then top deck Gul'dan. Exactly. So maybe that was the 0.01% out for him there. But good on G9 for spotting it. And this is why, to be honest, from G9, I don't actually like the strategy he's going for with his war. What he's saying is, I will make my matchups weaker against the aggro decks because I think it's good enough for Red to go for the cube and the doom cards. But give myself a win position against Priest, whereas I think the strategy you should be heading for in this Conquest tournament is to go for what purple and fire battles are doing. You just ban away the Priest completely and make sure with your Warlock you just basically never lose against aggro. Right, and we did see that lineup from Firebat shine, but right now, um, Aaron's kind of.